First, we'll hear from uh, Michelle Perro, who's been a pediatrician, uh, seen firsthand the damage done by our ag system to our kids, and uh, she'll speak to that. Howard Vigor is a farmer. He knows more about glyphosate use than anybody on the planet, maybe, and, uh, you know, um, can speak to that as a farmer. And uh, Stacy Malkin on the end is, uh, you know, I got to know Stacy during the 37 campaign when she was the um, media director for that campaign. And, and uh, you know, I, I've actually come to view a lot of what's happening as uh, a media battle. You know, it's a media battle for the hearts and minds of the, uh, the people of the earth in terms of what they want to eat and uh, what kind of world they want to live in. So. Uh, my hat's off to all these folks. And I think we'll start with Michelle, who uh, will kick us off. Thanks. Coming after John D. Liu's presentation, very global, I'm going to bring it down to the personal. Because I'm a clinician, I work on the front line taking care of kids. That's what I do. And they're not feeling so good. So it's really hard for me to talk about the big global picture 12 years from now when I have a sick kid right in front of me. I'm, I have to be very practical. And moms want things fixed now, chop, chop. So let's get started. So why are we so confused? Because when the average citizen Googles, are GMOs safe to eat, they come up with this stuff. Things like, oh gee, the um, American Medical Association said they're fine to eat. Or how about the National Academy of Science? No problem with GMOs. The New York Times reporter, Janie Brody, she tells us, well, what does Jane say? Take some time to learn about how genetic engineering works and the benefits it can offer now in the future as climate change takes an ever grading toll on food supplies. So this is what we see when we Google our GMO safe to eat. So the, it's out there, and I agree with Mark, it's a media blitz, and this is what we're up against. Next slide. So there I am. So what I have to ask, oh, I've, I've got my own little devices. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, that, that's good. So I asked myself, well, and I've asked myself this back in 2006 when I first learned about GMOs. I didn't know about a thing about it before then. Are they safe? Let, let me figure out my own research about whether these things are safe or not. So how are our kids doing? You're not going to hear an MD speak unless you get some statistics. I'm not going to kill you with it because people start to glaze over with too many numbers. But let's, let me give you the breakdown of how our American children are doing. One out of two now has a chronic disease. And that's from a study done in 2011. I bet it's higher now. If you look at these statistics, one out of 13 have severe food allergies. And that doesn't even count the kid with sensitivities and intolerances like gluten, dairy, soy. Those are real. Those aren't just fads. That's a real deal. Asthma, one in eight white children, one in six African-American children, and Latino kids are all over the map because it's not just one big Latino group. Mexican-American is about one in six. Puerto Rican children, it's one in five. It's all over the place. One in 58 have autistic spectrum disorder. That's one in 34 boys. And a colleague of mine who uh, works in China says the issue is one in 25 kids in China. They're having an epidemic of disease in kids in China. I think you could probably figure out why. ADHD is now one in 10 kids. And it goes on and on and on. Neurocognitive disorder, sleep issues, mental health problems like OCD, depression, anxiety. 46% of teens now have a mental health disorder. So Dr. Doom and Gloom here is telling you that this picture is not good. And it's within my lifetime of practice. I only really started seeing this change in about 2000. I've been practicing medicine since 1982 for about 37 years. I've been at it a while. You think by now, I'll get it right. Oh, yeah, I wrote this book. Um, so why did I write this book? I couldn't take it anymore. I'm kind of a passionate gal, as you may notice. And I had enough. And I thought, well, gee, even if I saw 10, 15, 20 kids in the clinic, that's not the thousands, millions of kids that are affected. So I sat my tushy in a chair, which is not easy to do. And with a really smart, tushy is a pediatric word. Come on. 
So with a really smart medical anthropologist from UCSF, Dr. Vince, Adam, Vince Ann Adams and I, we wrote this book. It took four years. We interviewed my patients. It was a labor of love. I'm glad I did it. I'll never do it again. <laughs> so this is how our kids are doing. I think I'm trying to paint the picture. Are you all getting the picture? Yeah, yeah thank you. OK, let's move on. So every talk I give, I make sure I mention the work of Dr. Arpad Pusti, because this is the gentleman who changed my mind about the way things are going. He was really the first scientist to look at GMOs when they were being brought into Europe in 1996. He was a brilliant scientist, and I'll keep it brief. And Dr. Arpad Pusti's work, when I learned about that, I said, you've got to, you've got to be kidding me. I put that little film under there. Um, scientist under attack. It's because it's what happened doc to Dr. Arpad Pusti after his work was announced. When he lost his lab, his career, he went from a hero to a villain in about 48 hours. But if you watch that movie, you'll hear his story. I suggest you all take a look at that if you really want to see what happens to scientists who make uh, suggestions, criticisms, or concern about genetically modified food. And I put up this slide, so you now all have to enter my world in just a second. And that's what a slide looks like of the gut underneath the microscope. It's called histopathology. But I think you all can appreciate, even though you're not physicians or pathologists, the differences between a GMO-fed group of rats that ate this genetically modified potato that Dr. Pusti engineered and the non-GMO-fed rats. And what you can see are disruptions of the intestinal villi, those little finger-like projections that line your intestine that are responsible for nutrient absorption. And when I first saw this slide in 2006, I said, oh my goodness, is this why our kids have leaky guts? Is this why our children all have gut disturbances? It all begins in the gut. Dr. Pusti also looked at the tummies of those rats, and he said, gee, look at that, increase cellular growth. That's called hyperplasia, which is a precursor to cancer. That's what he found. He found a whole bunch of other stuff as well. And when you look, if you read the book, you'll find out more about it. You can look at the movie. Because for sake of time, I won't go into it to it to today. We have a panel. But it was pretty shocking what Dr. Pusti found. So the main potential sources of adverse health effects from GMO foods. We say GM, GMO, it's, it, the, those terms are synonymous, GE, genetically engineered. People say, well, we don't know. Well, actually, we do. We not only know, we have it sorted out pretty darn clear on what the effects are. Be clear, there are no studies in humans on the effects of genetically modified food. It's all been extrapolated from laboratory animals and farm animals, from cows to pigs to chickens. So, I mean, I'm a pediatrician. I'm kind of close. So I can extrapolate that data into what's going on with kids. And I can't say it better than what I wrote. Three processes, the process, the G I'm just going to read it. You all, let's just read it along with me. The GM transformation process causes mutations, genetic mutations, can result in unintended alterations in food composition, such as new toxicants and allergens, food allergies, right? Mentioned that already. And the altered nutrient content Nutrients can affect our epigenome. Not, our genes don't change quickly. It takes thousands of years. But what is change are these little, these little proteins and um, little groups on top of our genome. They're called our epigenetics. And those are affected by nutrients. And that's the study of uh, nutrigenomics, a relatively new field of medicine. You are what you eat, right? Gene product. Bt toxin may be toxic or, and or allergenic in itself and farming. The use of GMOs increases toxic, toxic exposures, as you saw by that map in that film shown by John Rulak, um, increased toxic pesticide residues and crop contamination. So we understand the process. We understand how this is happening. So fast forward from Dr. Arpad Pusti's work in 1996 to 1998 to Dr. Michael Antonio. He's the head of gene expression and gene therapy in, um, in London. And Michael did a study using cutting edge technology on metabolomics. And he looked at whether the GM process, the product is the same as the non-GM process using cutting edge tools. And the, I'm giving you studies so you don't think this is woo-woo medicine, because those of us who speak out against it who are MDs, we have to really decrease the woo-woo factor, right? Otherwise, we get skewered. 
So he found that, these, that the genetic modification process produced significant changes in metabolites and different things that were not the same. In particular, what concerned me, it caused increased oxidative stress. That's like a rusting process in your body, which can be linked to cancer, as well as increased sub, uh, substances in your body called polyamines, also that could be tumor forming, et cetera. So this idea of equivalence out the window. I, I have to throw one shout out to um, this gal, Belinda Martineau. She studied the flavor saver tomato from Davis um, in the 80s. She herself is a genetic engineer. She, she banned um, her own tomato, her flavor saver tomato. And um, you should look at her blog called Biotech Salon, where she's an outspoken critic as well. She wrote a book too uh, a few years ago. So the findings you may find um, in lab animals fed GMOs. This is um, probably not even a complete list, but this is what they have. Look at this. Altered blood biochemistry, effects on male fertility, stomach lesions, allergic reactions, immune disturbance, enlarged lymph nodes. I see kids with big lymph nodes all the time. By the way, changes in organs such as liver, pancreas, hormonal disruption, endocrine disruption liver and kidney dis, uh, damage. You saw the changes in the gut lining from Dr. Pusey's work, others have done it too. The uterine lining in pigs and other animals is heavier often, and alteration of the gut bacteria. Don't mess with your microbiome. Some more, this is a quick showing you now modern techniques using electron microscopy of the changes as well. I just wanna show you the scientifically validated. Oh. Kind of a bad slide, but this is from Zen Honeycutt and Moms Across America. 31 million meals, uh, GMO meals are served to our children. I work with a group called Conscious Kitchen, bringing organic food to public schools. Woo. Okay, I'm, I get pissed off kind of easy, but this really pissed me off. We're going after Bob's Red Mill. He's not a bad guy. Okay, we, we, you know, I looked at this, I said, go after Nestle, Quaker Oats, General Mills. Why are we going after Bob? He's, he's, not, he's not a bad dude. Just had to throw my political two cents in there. It's hard to not do this work and be a little politically active, right? Oh, I, I just a shout out to Mark Squire, because my husband, <laughs> my husband said, Michelle, we've got to leave, move out of Fairfax, get out to the country. And I said, oh my God, leave Good Earth? No way. I live in Fairfax. So what do I see clinically? I'm gonna make it super quick. I got the time, you know, the, the, the time ticker running. Tummy aches, big fat tummies, kids refluxing their food, constipation, 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 smelly, yucky, smelling poo, dark circles, every time, uh, type of allergy, um, eczema, et cetera. Those are called atopic diseases, asthma. Uh, behavioral issues, sleep problems, sleep disorders, et cetera. The clinical effects of GMOs, here you see it. Immune dysfunction, microbiome imbalance, leaky gut, chronic inflammation, and toxicity. This is not rocket science. We can break this down. We also know how to treat it. How do I treat it? How do I deal with these effects? Simple, we eat organic. I often have to put children on certain elimination diets, usually gluten and dairy, but I can often bring it back. Probiotics, restore their nutrients, and we detoxify them. It's not that complicated. That's how you find me. I run a website, um, gmoscience.org, and we are committed to understanding the science behind genetic modification, their associated pesticides, with a lens on health. Thank you. What's the motivation? Technology fees are the royalty that are collected on every bag of genetically engineered seed that is sold to farmers. And I started selling seed in 1984. I thankfully quit selling seed in 2010. And I did the math in 2010 to see how much of dollars this would generate in one year if all farmers in the U.S. planted the latest and greatest genetically engineered crop on every acre of the volume of GE crops we were using. So quickly going through that, 
corn that year, according to USDA numbers, we had 87.9 million acres and a tech fee was $60 per acre based on the charge of the tech fee per bag of corn. So that would generate $5,274,000,000. Soybeans, we had 78.9 million acres for $24 an acre. That would kick in another 1.893 million, billion, excuse me, 10.9 million uh, acres on cotton at $78 an acre. And throw in the sugar beets, throw in the canola, and without figuring the Roundup Ready alfalfa tech fees that year, that would generate just under $8.7 billion. And I've been privileged to speak in Canada several times, so I didn't want to leave our neighbors to the north out of that equation, so I put in the tech fees that would be generated on the acres of canola in Canada. And that gives us a rough estimate of $9.9 billion for one year in the U.S. and Canada. That's not the seed, that's not the fertilizer, that's not the chemical, that's just the technology fee if we have 100% implementation. What's the motivation? <laughs> cotton, I had the privilege of working with cotton producers for a few years down in southwest Georgia, and they went from paying at the most $60 a bag for cotton seed before it was genetically engineered up to $697.19. And let me tell you, it hasn't gotten cheaper since then. So I've been privileged to speak a lot of places about this subject. And I was up in Washington State helping with the I-522 ballot initiative. And we were in a very conservative part of the state. And one person showed up for the meeting. And it was probably the most amazing meeting I've ever had. This person was a retired molecular microbiologist from Washington State University, and I said, you had a one in 100,000 to put in the insertion in the same spot twice in the DNA. She politely raised her hand. She says, Howard, that's not true. She sent me this slide. It's one in a trillion to one in a 100 trillion chance of getting it in the same spot twice. Well, why is that important? You're going to find out. The new generation of genetic engineering with CRISPR they say, oh, well, it's more precise. Well, wait a minute, how can it be more precise? You told us the first one was precise. But anyway, it's more precise, so we can cut and remove and everything is hunky-dory. Well, what about the spatial relationship? There can only be up to 16,000 relevant changes based on studies we have seen. So the end result is, and Dr. Pustai, who I was privileged to be mentored from by starting in 2003, 2004 time period, he said that just the process of genetic engineering gives an extremely high likelihood of developing a foreign protein. So what's that mean to us then as far as the foreign protein? How does that affect mammals? <clears throat> that foreign protein enters the digestive tract, an alarm goes off, that, 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 foreign invader, foreign invader, do something. Immune system does its job. I'm going to step away from the mic, but you'll hear me. I'm the immune system, here's the foreign protein. I'm gonna get rid of it 24-7, 365. What happens when I do this 24 hours a day? I get tired. So, do we have an increase in autoimmune diseases? I think Dr. Perrell just spelled that out for us. That brings me to the gory part of my presentation. I've been privileged to work with crop and livestock producers all across the US and Canada since 1992. When genetically engineered crops were in the feed supply, we saw issues with reproductive, and we saw issues with digestive. Well, when the pigs have digestive issues and they succumb to the disease, we have this thing called a post-mortem, and we're seeing severe inflammation and ulcers in the stomachs on a consistent basis. I shared this information with Dr. Elaine Ingham in 2004, and she said, well, do a study. So I was privileged to uh, connect with Dr. Judy Carmen, who's in the background in this picture from Australia. She's the head scientist on the study that we conducted. And we took 84 pigs and put them in this group and 84 pigs and put them in this group and fed them for their lifetime on non-GMO and GMO rations. This is what a healthy pig stomach is supposed to look like. Notice the skin tone color. 
This is what the severely inflamed pig stomach looks like. And <clears throat> I won't tell you what they do with this as far as further value added products up the meat chain. Uh, you might lose your lunch, even though you haven't had it yet. The results of our study, there was a 260% increased likelihood of severe inflammation in the pigs that consumed the GM feed. Of the, of the breakdown between males and females, it was 400% for the males and 220% for the females. The weight of the utera of the GM-fed female was 25% abnormally heavy. We didn't have the money to f do the further histological analysis to determine what that may mean. Those were the two statistical scientific findings. This was the part of the study that got my attention in the biggest way, and I can thank Dr. Pustai for this actually happening, because he mandated that we weigh these pigs every week. When they were little, we put them up, picked them up, put them on the scale, got their number and got their weight, wrote it down, let them go. But when they got bigger, you can't pick them up, put them on the scale anymore. So we had this simple corral that they would go through every week, run through the circle corral, come down the alleyway, get on the scale, write down the number, write down the weight, let them go. The, pig, the people that were weighing the pigs didn't know who was fed what, but the pigs were always in the same pen. They knew this pen and this pen would go through this thing a lot quicker than this pen and this pen. And the, this, these two pens over here that wouldn't go through it fast enough, as soon as you got them in confined quarters, they started fighting and biting and picking on one another. So we had difficulty performing simple tasks. We were irritable. And when they were back in their normal environment, they were listless. They never exhibited a level of contentment. That's not a statistical scientific finding. But in 1996, there was not GMO food in 85% of the processed foods in the grocery store, GMO ingredients, I should say. Today, there is. Is there a change in the amount of mood-altering medications that have been prescribed between then and now? Could there be a connection? Well, let's look at the big picture. Do you recognize any of the names in the center of the circle? Have you ever seen a commercial on TV that says, if you can't afford your medication costs, we have a program to assist you? Commercial sponsored by AstraZeneca Syngenta. Have you ever heard of atrazine, the oldest herbicide on the market for corn made by AstraZeneca Syngenta, who is now owned by ChemChina, who happens to be the number four producer of genetically engineered seed in the world? When you see or hear bear, what's the first thing you think of? Aspirin. Bear crop science is also an ad, and you know, we're tying the thing together. It's getting smaller right along as we go here. So, bear also makes Aztec insecticide, Liberty herbicide, genetically engineered crops. And before they were purchased for, by, before bear purchased Monsanto for the sale price of $66 billion, and $289 million worth of liability in the first case, they were the number, number whatever on genetically engineered crops. Before they bought Monsanto, Monsanto was owned by Pfizer Upjohn Pharmacia. So we have established the fact that all the companies in the center of the circle are in the pharmaceutical and the chemical business. Here's where you're going to help me out. Chemical. I want you to give me one word that you would use to describe a chemical that kills a weed or an insect, and you're describing this chemical to a five-year-old child. What one word might you use? Poison. poison. Okay, we're using poison to raise crops. What do we raise crops for? Food. Cereal and grain. What do we feed the bulk of the grain to? Livestock. So if we're in using this poison to raise a crop, if there were to be a residual effect, do you think it'll be positive or negative? negative? So if there's a negative effect and we feed the grain to the livestock and the livestock don't feel good, who do you call for help? When the veterinary comes, what might he recommend you give that animal to make him feel good? Antibiotics. What if you want that animal to grow faster? Well, we'll give him a little few steroids. What do we raise livestock for? Meat. Who eats the meat? So, 
if there's an adverse residual effect of using the poison on the crop that might affect the rain, it could affect the livestock, is there a chance that it could affect the meat? If the people eat the meat and they don't feel good, where do they go? After you go to the doctor, where might he send you with his autograph on a piece of paper? Does that present a positive cash flow for the company in the center of the circle? If you don't have a copy of this book, what are you waiting for? And if you've already read it, give it to someone else. If this book doesn't make the New York Times bestsellers list, our country don't have a chance because we're dependent on the children. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much to all of you truth tellers for everyone standing up for a food system that respects and values life. Um, I love John's talk this morning, and I, I, in the focus on solutions, my job these days is to focus on the dysfunctions, and I've been studying the dysfunctions behind the media headlines, and how is it that the dominant mainstream narrative has become to question the benefits of organic, to hype up the high-tech food future as appetizing and desirable. That's a tough PR job. Um, and I love that corn image on the front of popular science because it's just, yeah, this is how they're selling it. And then, most especially how um, the propaganda campaigns have presented themselves as champions of science and have really uh, managed to paint the entire community of scientists, doctors, community activists, pesticide activists, moms trying to protect their children as um, in the words of the GMO Impossible Burgers communications director, uh, anti-science fundamentalists. She wrote an amazing piece just excoriating everybody raising concerns about the burger. Um, so they're really sort of in desperate, in a difficult corner, let's say. Um, and the how these uh, media narratives carry forth um, is really because there's an entire industry in and of itself devoted to it. Um, so corporations and their investors spending tens of millions of dollars a year on public relations firms, front groups, media forums, government and academic forums that repeat the same corporate talking points again and again. Um, and so my group, U.S. Right to Know, we're a tiny organization, four people. We got started in 2015, and we've been investigating how the food and chemical companies operate behind the scenes to manipulate media, the public, uh, policymakers, and regulators, really toward um, the, the storyline that the way that we must feed the future is to export the U.S. system of genetically engineered chemical-dependent monoculture farming to other countries and also create food additives and food substitutes in labs with genetically engineered yeast and algae. So that's the vision of the future. Um, and we've been looking at sort of how this works behind the scenes. And what I want to talk about today, because we know so much more today than we did even two years ago about how this whole operation is working. And I'll talk about why in a minute. But I'm going to focus today on the three, on the Achilles heels, the, the weak spot, the weak point, the soft underbelly, the chink in the armor of um, these massively funded propaganda campaigns that are resulting in storylines like I just talked about. And so I'm going to talk about three today um, that it's helpful for us to know about and to exploit as much as possible and use. And the first is that the corporate playbook is becoming exposed. Um, and this is because we now have access to tens of thousands of pages of documents that were before hidden about how um, Monsanto and their allies are operating behind the scenes with a pretty vast array of third-party allies, academics, uh, friendly reporters, and others who work together. And we can see in the documents how they're working together. Um, and we've been reporting about that at US Right to Know. And we have our own investigation, which has generated tons of documents about um, from Freedom of Information Act requests, and also, of course, the Monsanto papers that are coming out of the Roundup trials. 
have resulted in a lot, but just a fraction so far of those have been um, put into the public. So the lawyers are saying only about 10% of the documents they have have been so far made public. So that's something that is really um, freaking out the, the companies. And you can check out, uh, we have all these documents um, posted on our website, so you can check out these URLs. But also, and this is so exciting, we now have all those documents posted at the UCSF Chemical Industry Documents Library. This is the same, <laughs> thank you, yeah. This is, this is a huge step forward because they're searchable and the search function works really great. It's the same library that hosts the tobacco documents. So you can search for your name, your friends' names, <laughs> they're probably in there, um, and use these documents. So. Just as an example of some of the info that's coming out, this is a document that was uh, put forth by the lawyers in the trials, and it was Monsanto's PR plan to discredit the scientists of the World Health Organization cancer panel that found glyphosate to be probably carcinogenic to humans. And you can see at the top their goal, protect the reputation of Roundup and provide cover for regulatory agencies. And they also list all of the industry partners, and they talk about in the rest of the plan how their goals are messaging-wise to orchestrate outcry about the scientists and to put forth the Mon POV, Monsanto point of view. So all these groups, this is another image of the groups that they named, and they put them in four tiers. They were basically uh, trade associations, then front groups, then food industry spin groups, and growers associations. So with this vast array of groups uh, working to push forth the Mon POV. So um, one of the things that we see clearly from the documents is that the groups doing like the most hardline messaging um, really trace straight back to you know, cutting their teeth, the founders of those groups with the Phyllis Morris campaigns to keep cigarettes unregulated. And so we have groups like the Genetic Literacy Project, Stats, Sense About Science, uh, putting forth um, the, you know, as I said, hardline messages, the, the climate denier comparisons, people raising concerns about GMO or the climate deniers of the left. Who's heard that one? And um, you know, there's a consensus of safety that absolutely everyone agrees. And they also very, run very vicious attacks on scientists, uh, journalists, advocacy groups. And then those are sort of filtered up through um, academics and friendly reporters who maybe are a little bit less um, aggressive in the messaging or they'll write things like, well, some people say that um, GMO critics are the climate deniers of the left. Amy Harmon wrote that in the New York Times in 2014, and we see in the documents that John Entine pitched her that story from the Genetic Literacy Project, and her sources were Entine's friends, um, and then, of course, other reporters and academic institutions repeat those messages again and again. So, we're getting together the connections. We have uh, fact sheets about all of the Monsanto partner groups on the U.S. Right to Know website, and just as I said, starting to piece together the map of how it all works, and there's lots more to come. So the second Achilles heel, and I think this is a really big deal, a lot of the groups that really found success in pushing forth this, everyone agrees that GMOs are safe, have been forced into a position now of also defending Roundup with pretty ridiculous positions and using the Monsanto talking points. So here's an example of some quotes about the cancer scientists, and somehow these groups have presented themselves as champions of science while also outright attacking scientists. And so uh, the IARC cancer scientists from the World Health Organization are anti-chemical enviros who lied, who conspired to misrepresent the health risks of glyphosate. That was Genetic Literacy Project. The second one, the cancer report is scientific fraud perpetrated by activist scientists. That's the American Council on Science and Health, which it just came out, was getting directly paid by Monsanto, even though Monsanto doesn't even want to work with them because they're no, they know they're so disreputable. But they actually said in one of the documents just released at trial, we have to take all the friends we can get because we're running out of friends. 
So the third, uh, the cancer report was a witch hunt orchestrated by anti-Monsanto scientists, activists who abused science and committed an obvious perversion of both science and natural justice by reporting a cancer risk. That was Cornell <laughs> Alliance for Science, Mark Linus. Yeah, and then Mark Linus also says on the Cornell website, glyphosate is the most benign chemical in world farming. Now this is the, the anti-villain from John's talk, is Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation. They are investing massive amounts of money in, this is just one example, the propaganda campaign at Cornell. They've put $12 million into a straight up communications PR campaign, elevating people like Mark Linus. It's not scientists, it's PR writers, um, some of them who've worked for the chemical industry for years, defending BPA, phthalates, all the chemicals. And they're actually training fellows around the world to advocate for genetic engineering, and they have a big focus on opening up markets in Africa to GMOs. They've also funded a lot of people to beat up on pesticide activists in Hawaii. They're constantly commenting and writing blogs attacking journalists and community activists. So, if we could get Bill Gates to switch to the eco-farm model, wouldn't that be amazing? Um, okay, so the third Achilles heel, and this is my favorite, and I think it's actually a really big one, um, is that these campaigns have no idea how to talk to women. They are just struggling. And of course, the food industry is mostly run by men. All, most of the decision-making um, seats of power are held by men, and that's true of the boardrooms, the CEOs, the investment firms, the PR firms. And so this is the kind of campaign they come up with. <laughs> this is an actual photo of an actual ad uh, done by the International Food Information Council. So this was one of the, and it says, <laughs> Before we freak out, you know, don't freak out about glyphosates, ask the experts, the real experts. And then it says at the bottom, don't glyphosate, hate, let's communicate. I mean, it's just so stupid. They, so the, this was, um, so IFIC, this group, was part of Monsanto's stakeholder engagement team. So this was, um, list, they were listed in the document I showed you earlier that along with the Grocery Manufacturers Association and another group called the Center for Food Integrity, which was started by a guy from the swine industry who has a whole PR firm that does the work of this group. So they were they're part of this stakeholder engagement team to alert the food companies to Monsanto's talking points and how they were going to inoculate against the cancer report on glyphosate. So along with this, they had um, things, blogs that were called uh, Eight Crazy Ways They're Trying to Scare You About Fruits and Vegetables and uh, Cutting Through the Clutter on Glyphosate. So this is how they think that women want to get information about their food. And the food companies really invest heavily in this group. They, they spent $30 million in just five years on this kind of messaging and the funders include Bayer, Cargill, Dow DuPont, Kellogg, Mars, Nestle, and PepsiCo. Um, and I loved your slide, Howard, about the pharmaceutical chemical industrial complex. And I wanted to also mention that AstraZeneca also started Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And I wrote a whole chapter, I have a book about cosmetic safety, and I have a whole chapter called Pink Washing and then the Cancer Industrial Complex. So yeah, we're getting, they're profiting from it, and so they're selling it with everything they can, even with these senseless campaigns, as they're backed into a corner. Um, two more things about IFIC. We have an email just to show how they operate. This email went out to like 30 corporate CEOs from IFIC asking them to donate $10,000 each for an initiative called Understanding Our Food that tries to convince consumers that processed food is okay and desirable and healthy. Um, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture gave them over $170,000 of our tax money to start a communicator's guide for promoting GMO foods. Yeah, so all these documents, again, are on our website. We have a fact sheet about this group and all the other groups. Um, and so it's quite daunting, but I want to say that the, the antidote to this, the force against this, of course, is telling the truth. Uh, people know the truth. You can't buy the truth, and they can't get away with this forever. And so I do see this system is starting to fall. It's starting to become obvious. Um, 
And so what is it going to take is, you know, all of us telling the real and true stories about how food choices and food policy can heal our families, heal our communities, and heal the planet. And so please use our resources, share our resources. Um, if you have any stories or documents about things that are happening behind the scenes, give them to us. Um, and yeah, let's create the food system that our children deserve. Thank you all so much. Um, Stacy's book is called Not Just a Pretty Face, right? So yeah, I'm with these authors and they, they don't plug their stuff enough and we gotta support them. Um, and in that line, uh, Stacy's um, cohort uh, that works with her on U.S. Right to Know is going to speak Carrie Gillum tomorrow at four o'clock. And if you haven't seen her talk, she's amazing as well. Um, so I, d I don't have any uh, pictures or anything. And I think I'm e even going to keep my thing kind of brief because I want to make sure everybody has time to ask questions of these folks that are uh, so awesome. Um, but I, I did want to talk, uh, Stacy talked a little bit about the Impossible Burger, and I, I think I've come to believe that we are actually at the, at the verge of our food system making another uh, huge, huge shift, and uh, it's all being generated right here in the San Francisco Bay Area. I last year I went to this. Um, group a meeting that was like this bigger but um that was called sin bio beta where all the biotech people arrive and are talking about all their exciting projects that they're working on and the impossible burger is an example of that and so what what i think is happening in the food business is that uh with climate disruption uh world agriculture struggling their reaction to that is not to fix the problem, but, oh, let's just uh, start growing our food in vats, and we'll feed them sugar that we've stored, so we don't have to worry about the storms and stuff. And much of our worldwide agriculture, they, they have plans on the drawing board to absolutely eliminate it. You know, most of the flavorings, uh, uh, vanilla, um, saffron, uh, many, you know, even um, human breast milk they're even working on. So their, their vision is that they're gonna basically genetically engineer, uh, they're using yeasts and algal species uh, and bacteria that will spit out whatever food substance we, they deem we need. Uh, and it's all happening right here in the Bay Area. And I, I think it's absolutely time to um, have a revolution around it. Uh, one of the things that happened just in the last couple of months is that um, Cargill, which uh, I guess most of you know Cargill is a, one of the biggest food producers in the United States, has come out with this substance called uh, Eversweet, which is basically they have uh, genetically engineered a yeast to spit out a stevia-like substance. So you're, you're probably going to see it in Coca-Cola, uh, non non dairy coca cola is here coming out this year, but it 's a genetically engineered sweetener, and that is only just the beginning. The impossible burger is a um, meat substitute flavoring uh, you know it 's fascinating i I was fascinated when I learned about the impossible burger and how it came to market and the amount of testing you know I actually I knew that GMO regulations were absolutely faulty and flawed and that there was not much testing going on, but, but to read the story of how the Impossible Burger came to market, there was absolutely nothing there. They, the, in fact, it was even worse than that is that they did submit data to FDA to try and get grass status for their uh, flavoring and were refused. The documents, in fact, it was uh, US Right to Know that brought a lot of that uh, to light. But um, the, the FDA documents are, um, I guess on, on the Friends of the Earth website, is that where you can see them? Um, they're all public now, and the FDA actually wrote back to Impossible, your data is completely insufficient to, to prove any safety of this new protein that you're feeding everybody, and uh, Impossible's reaction to that was, well, 
we, we, we have this end run around those regulations and we can just bring it to market anyway without that acknowledgement from the government. So you can buy the Impossible Burger all over California and the United States in your local burger places. And um, they, um, I, I had learned that they have this uh, $400 million budget that they're dealing with to make a veggie burger, right? So where is that money going? It's going into PR. So they are trying very, very hard to get the Impossible Burger out to market and they're actually targeting vegan. And if you hear the CEO of um, Impossible Burger talk, it's all about we're offering a green solution. We're going to uh, elim eliminate CAFO beef operations by getting everybody to eat these veggie burgers because they have blood on them and it will be accepted. And it's all a bunch of hype. So, um, in fact, with the. Um, one of the other things that occurred around the Eversweet uh, sweetener that we're about to see on the market is that uh, there's a certification organization that's called QAI that has a um, part of the organization that does GMO um, verification work, just like the, the non-GMO project does. Uh, however, their, their one is called uh, True North Verification. And True North has come out and verified this GMO um, yeast product, Eversweet, as GMO free, believe it or not. And they, they've done it on the basis of the fact that there is, they, they say, well, there's not GMOs in the final product, right? We've refined it completely away all that's left is the sweetener compound. And that sort of illustrates what we're going to see more and more in our food system is that um, they will not, you know, they are trying really hard to do this end run around, no, oh, these aren't GMOs, they're not GMOs, because I think they've, you know, there's enough public opinion about GMOs out there right now that they realize they don't want to, you know, mix with that crowd. Uh, so they're trying really, really hard to convince us, well, these, these are new products. They're the products of fermentation. They're not genetically engineered. There's no, you know, they really are. And that's, you know, at the core of much of their languaging, what you'll notice is that um, they're really trying to confuse us. And uh, the implication, you know, I believe that this new wave of VAT-produced uh, foods that we're uh, starting to see come out, um, one of the real uh, sinister aspects of it is what it could do to farmers worldwide because many of these, uh, the, the crops that they seem to be targeting are these high value flavoring crops and they also happen to be many of the crops that are helping farmers worldwide to hang on, you know. Uh, uh, vanilla, saffron, you know, high valued crops are, you know, part of what's protecting us from cutting down rainforests is uh, that there's some economic value there, Brazil nuts and et cetera. So uh, I, I believe it's a really, um, you know, in, we're in a very important part of history right now. And uh, I, I wish you would all come to the SynBio Beta Conference next, next year. And, stand in front and stop these guys from uh, uh, really changing our world. But so with that, um, maybe I'll, uh, you know, open it up if there's questions. I think we have a little bit of time. I'm uh, partly the timekeeper here, so I uh, don't know how much time we have. But uh, I think we can uh, entertain a few questions. Sir. It's okay. Yeah. I just want to make a statement how long ago we've been programmed to accept synthetic food in uh, science fiction when I was in grammar school. So we've got that power of suggestion going in us that that's a good idea. It's a hard one to roll back because it's been there gestating for a very long time. Um, hi. So first of all, I want to thank you all for speaking and just kind of putting words and um, backing up with science, what I see as an educator in the school system. 
Um, some of the images and hearing some of the words was really hard and really set heavy with me because I see that in my own students. Um, and kind of being up here, I wanted to present a call to action. Um, we received this information and um, it would make sense to act after, not to just sit with it and just nothing really changes. Um, as a garden and nutrition educator, um, it's really hard to find funding to feed my kids organically. And kids that are directly impacted by what we saw up here, they need organic and they need produce so they're able to heal. Um, they need access to the healing medicines that they haven't had access to, that ancestrally they have been like, or they've been cut off that their ancestors knew. So, um, yeah. Oh, one minute? Okay. So I just wanted to thank y'all for speaking and sharing that information and also to just put it out there that people need access to food and you can do something. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, super good point, super quick response to that. I did work with a daycare to um, switch to organic food. We were able to do it and come under bud budget. The most common complaint I hear is that organic food is too expensive. That, the way to get around that is somebody has to get in the kitchen. And I don't just mean mom. Everybody has to get back in the kitchen. Processed foods cost more than um, foods from bulk. If you buy rice and beans, it's very affordable, along with some, a little bit of meat and some veggies, you're all good to go. So this idea that it's too expensive is based on processed foods, and I work with communities to come under budget to eat organic. A big thank you to all the speakers and the organizers of this conference. My question is for Stacy. You seem to be an expert in the communication strategy of the opposing side. So taking into account all of that um, information and knowledge, how, did, how does that influence our communication strategy? Yeah, that's a great question, and I think about that all the time. I mean, I think that... Groups are out there doing it, and they're doing it great, and that's why there's so much pushback. Um, I really think it comes down to people telling personal stories about what's working for them and their families and healing children, like the stories M Michelle's telling about firsthand uh, experience with seeing children heal. And that's happening with a lot of people, the um, communities that are dealing with food allergies or infertility or kids, you know, and there was just sort of a, a study that came out of Harvard and JAMA where they looked at women eating organic food that were undergoing high-tech infertility treatments and women on a regular diet and the women on the organic diet had much better outcomes than those eating pesticide treated foods. So, um, you know, getting that those stories out, but I, I really do think it's the personal experience of people dealing with those health effects and talking to each other. And this is where a big advantage comes in because women are getting information from other women, from community groups they trust, from you know, health groups they trust, not from the companies advertising to us on TV, which maybe it used to be, or the magazines telling people what to think. Those channels no longer work, and I think that as well, or as they used to, and I think that's why companies are struggling so hard to, fi how to figure out how to message to women. And they're really doing some ridiculous things like, hiring women to insult other women and, and things like that. Um, but when you look at where sort of who's getting big audiences, people like the Food Babe or Momovation or some of the mom, they, you know, female bloggers, um, that I get, I'm really excited by those possibilities of figuring out how to connect with each other better online and stronger and sharing resources and sharing the truth um, about how to find a path to healing. So, and I want to, I don't know, is the other part of the answer, and I want to hear from others who have ideas about how to translate this stuff into concrete actions to do better. You know, I, I just want to say, I, I apologize for this, but we really probably have question, one more question okay. uh, before we get the hook up here. We're, get, we're already getting the, <laughs> thanks. Uh, I'll be quick. Um, well, it's, it is a complex question. Maybe you can just refer me to somewhere else where I can do the research, but, uh, or all of us. Um, there seems to be uh, a lot of media about the complexity of GMOs because it's not 
Obviously, if you're a, a person with a certain kind of worldview and you look at the over-application of pesticides because of genetically modified uh, crops that can be resistant to the massive amounts of poison that they're putting on that, that's a very straightforward, well, probably avoid that. Um, but there's also a, a narrative of GMOs that can create plants that can grow in drought-resistant climates and places that couldn't do that. Are they all the same? Is there a variance? Are there GMOs that are not as horrible as the GMOs that we associate with, with pesticide resilience? Is that something that we need to know more about? Remember that slide with the $9.9 .9 billion for one year? It's their story. They can tell it any way they want to. They've got more money than anybody can imagine. And Peter Collins asked me about commercials and promotion from that side when I was privileged to do an interview with him a month or so ago. This is a politically correct statement I'm going to make. There are massive amounts of organic matter from an intact bovine male that are spread about on a liberal basis on every day that they're doing. Now you have to understand farm animals to get the full extent of that comment. I just have a quick answer to that, that I think, I think it's a really important point. 99% of the GMOs right now, right now that we eat, are either herbicide resistant or insect resistant. And most of them both, over 80%, Roundup Ready, or they're creating an insecticide. There's less than 1% that do anything else. So they've had a very difficult time having complicated trait GMOs work. They haven't worked. They haven't been um, able to bring to market things like vitamin A rice or other things that have more complicated genetic traits. Um, yeah, a quick plug for GMO Science. So that website I mentioned at the end of my, my little spiel, the gmoscience.org, and we are committed to look at the science, on, um, particularly with the lens on health. And we did, um, and we're looking at golden rice right now, and I can tell you that was a rice that was genetically engineered to produce vitamin A, so kids want to have vitamin A deficiency, one of the leading world uh, causes of immune deficiency and uh, blindness in the world. And it, vitamin A is so cheap to produce. They've been at the golden rice, I believe, for 24 years, and it still has not come to market. There's all sorts of problems with that. We could have treated billions of children, vitamin A dosing, I think it's 50 cents a child to treat them. It's really a cheap product. So this idea about food, um, food improvements or nutrient improvements or you know, GMO crops require more water, et cetera. So it's not panned out. You'd be led to believe that, but nothing's panned out yet. Thank you so much to Michelle, Howard, Mark, and Stacy for that amazing presentation. And now we're going to move into our second plenary. Um, we're going to be talking about law as a tool. And we have the pleasure of having um, Adelita San Vicente with us. She is the director. She is the director of Fundacion Semillas de Vida, Seeds of Life Foundation, whose mission is the defense of healthy eating without GMOs and the protection of Mexican seeds. We also have Amber Eck with Hagston and Eck. She is a San Diego lawyer with experience holding corporations accountable through class action lawsuits. And we have Janelle Orsi, the executive director of Sustainable Economies Law Center and author of Practicing Law in the Sharing Economy. So let's welcome to the stage Adelita, Amber, and Janelle. Hi everybody, I'm Janelle Orsi and I thought I'd just kick us off by saying a few words of encouragement about the law because law is this thing that I think probably maybe half the people got up and left the room just now thinking, ugh, the law, this law is a tool, that's not my tool, I'll let other people use that tool, but um, it's really true, the law has really become something that's very hard for average people to understand, to access, and to use, but Hopefully I'll inspire us a little bit to change that. I'm not actually going to use those slides right now. I'm going to come, come back to those later. So yeah. But yeah, law is a, it's a tool. It's actually a set of tools. And you're going to hear a lot about impact litigation. 
um, and class action litigation in a minute from a couple of lawyers here on stage. Actually, Adelita, are you a lawyer? Oh, that's good. Okay, good. Because that's the other thing I want to say is uh, law is not a tool that we should leave in the hands of lawyers because the reality is law is created for all of us. It's really, it's our set of agreements as a society about how we want to live together, how we want to work together. And the legal profession itself has become really um, kind of fort fortified or inaccessible to most people. And it's also the least diverse profession in the United States and um, it's becoming less diverse. So we can't leave law in the, t in the hands of lawyers. We need to be using law as a tool, and it's not just litigation, it's also policy advocacy, which takes many forms and shapes. It's also transactional law, which is a lot of what I do, helping form new legal structures and organizations. Um, but one thing that I learned, because I, I went to law school, I went the traditional route and became a lawyer. I really rebelled against the law when I was in law school, because I hated law school. Uh, I got depressed, law made me feel stupid, so I really said, all right, I, if I'm going to keep doing law, I have to do it differently. So over the last 10 years, I've done a lot of things that I thought might be crazy, but included things like writing legal documents with cartoons in them, um, freely sharing information, uh, helping people become lawyers without going to law school. We've had three of my coworkers at Sustainable Economies Law Center just become lawyers that way. Um, we give legal advice in cafes, we throw big law parties and invite non-lawyers to come learn about the law. So we've really tried to basically bring law down to earth so it really can be a tool that people not only can use but that they enjoy using. So ma mainly the message here is you're going to hear a, a few different examples of the law and how it's used. This is sort of my, my ask to everybody that you should view law as a tool in your toolbox and that you don't have to use law on the terms that the legal profession or the legal system has set for you. In fact, probably better, you can start to challenge the way that the law has been used, challenge the way that people talk about the law, and so on. So I'll give you more examples later, but you can start to learn from a couple of our speakers here. I think starting with Amber, is that right? OK, thanks. Uh, thanks, Janelle. That was a really great introduction, and, and I echo all of that. Thank you all for being here and for all of the great work that you all do. Um, I'm going to speak from my perspective. I'm a, a lawyer in San Diego. Uh, I worked for one of the biggest plaintiff's law firms in the country, so someone who represents um, employees, shareholders, um, and, um, and just individuals, consumers. Uh, and about 10 years ago, I started my own law firm. We are now uh, 10 people, um, and we try to bring cases that make a difference. Um, of the cases recently that we've done that you may have heard of, we had a class action lawsuit against Donald Trump and Trump University uh, that we fought. <laughs> that we fought long and hard for eight years, uh, and it settled, uh, you know, a week before trial after he was elected. Uh, but we just, uh, the money was just distributed the spring of this year, $25 million um, that all went to the consumers, and uh, we didn't take a, any fees or costs in that case. The money all went to the class members. <laughs> So that's kind of my experience is these types of uh, class action cases, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about uh, briefly today. Um, the three kinds of cases that, that can be used and aren't always used in this context um, uh, but are uh, securities cases, securities fraud class actions as one, shareholder derivative cases as a second, and third are consumer fraud class actions. Um, so securities fraud class actions are cases that can be brought by shareholders against the corporation for making uh, false or misleading statements uh, to the public that end up harming the company. And uh, it, one case that's currently ongoing that is kind of interesting to watch is a case that was brought by my former law firm against ExxonMobil. And um, it, it involves the way that they calculated carbon costs. And they were essentially calculating the carbon costs at an amount drastically lower than they should have and that their competition was doing. Um, they finally had to reveal this. And when the truth came out, they had to take a $2 billion 
write down. So this uh, lawsuit is claiming that the, that you know by failing to disclose this information and doing this improperly, um, that it caused harm. And it's it's a little bit of a unique theory, but it, they filed, of course, a motion to dismiss the complaint. And on August 14th, the motion was just denied. So that case will move forward, and it should be an interesting one to watch. <laughs> Um, for shareholder derivative cases, they're a little bit differently, and they're brought um, by shareholders, but essentially on behalf of the corporation against the officers and directors, alleging that they breached their fiduciary duties. Um, and so those can be helpful sometimes in this context. We had a case um, several years ago against Chiquita, who is engaged in um, you know, illegal conduct, um, it, it, both environmental and bribes to officials, and ultimately we were able to recover uh, money and also able to get you know, certain corporate governance uh, enhancements, you know, kind of changing the way that, that they operate in the future and, and to kind of comply with the laws. Um, so again, it isn't always, those cases aren't always kind of used in this context, but I think in some cases they can be. Um, and then the third, which I think, you know, can't, again, can be used and has been used in some ways, sometimes more successfully than others, is the consumer fraud class action. So these are cases that can be brought um, on behalf of consumers against companies uh, alleging either that they engaged in illegal or improper or unfair practices or um, that you know, claims that they're making um, or omissions constitute false advertising. So that was essentially what our case against Trump University was, was that uh, they were making claims that, you know, you were going to learn from, you know, Donald Trump or experts hand-picked by him, and it was going to be a university-type environment, and, um, it, you know, and, and alleging that those statements were false. And uh, there have been a lot of cases you've seen kind of challenging statements um, by companies that their products are natural or organic, and some of these have been successful, some haven't, but um, I, it can be, you know, really valuable. There's a current case that our firm was involved in against Kellogg's um, and their garden burgers where they claimed that they were made with natural ingredients uh, when in fact they contained hexane, which is a you know, federally recognized synthetic and toxic chemical. Uh, so we brought claims on um, uh, for false advertising, violation of the California Legal Remedies Act, and other claims. And we're in the process of trying to get uh, the case certified as a class action. So that case is ongoing. Um, of course, you're familiar with all the various cases against Monsanto, uh, the individual cases, um, and there's a class action on behalf of, you know, of cancer patients, but there also is a consumer class action for misrepresentations that they've made, um, including representations that, you know, their products are safe to use. And uh, so that, that case is pending in uh, Los Angeles in federal court, so we can watch that as it continues. Um, and then a, another case that, that is recent is against Nestle uh, for their products. They, they have a seal on some of their products that say no GMO ingredients, and it looks very similar to the seal that is an official seal from the organization that can authorize those seals, but in fact, they granted it to themselves, and it was awarded to Nestle from Nestle. And... Um, it, their products, it includes products that uh, contain dairy from cows, fed GMO grains, and from other, and, and other GMO products. So that case uh, is, I believe it also just got passed um, a motion to dismiss and uh, is continuing on in the courts. Um, so that's just kind of an example of how some of these cases are used. These are cases, class actions are tougher to kind of bring on your own. It typically is the type of case where you need to get a lawyer or a law firm involved. Um, but the best cases come from people like you who kind of know the facts, know the information, know what's misleading. And so I'd say if you have, you know, things that, that, that you think are you know, improper, feel free to contact me or another uh, lawyer who specializes in class actions and, and we can look and see if it's it's something that, 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 that might work. Um, and then you can also, of course, you know, any letters, or, you know, just letting agencies know or even the Better Business Bureau, the Attorney General for your state, all of those can have some impact. And so I, 
That's all I have for now, and I'm happy to take questions later, but thank you all for attending. Bueno, yo les voy a hablar un poco del maíz, lo que es el significado profundo del maíz para nosotras en México y de una acción colectiva que estamos impulsando para impedir la siembra de maíz transgénico en México. I'm going to tell you about corn in Mexico and how much it means to us, and I'm going to tell you about the class action lawsuit that we're forming against in honor of this. Ajá. Primero que nada, es muy importante saber que el maíz para nosotros en, en México y Mesoamérica es el centro de nuestra cultura y de la civilización que habita ahí hace 10.000 años. First and foremost, the corn. Corn is a huge importance in our culture over thousands of years. Eh, como vemos en cualquier códice eh, que habla de la creación eh, de los mexicanos, está siempre presente el maíz. We can see in, in any part of the culture that the corn is always present. Y por eso eh, se dice que nosotros somos de maíz y el maíz a la vez nos hizo. And this is why we say we are from the, we are from the corn and the corn has made us. Eh, el maíz es una historia de éxito de más de 8,000 años de mejoramiento. Sí, el, el maíz cuenta con una historia de más de 8,000 años de éxito. Um, corn comes from more than a, a history of more than 8,000 years of, of success and cultivation. Es un, un cultivo que se adapta a cualquier condición, desde 3,000 metros sobre el nivel del mar. It's a cultivation that has success anywhere over 3,000 metros. Meters, sí. 3,000 meters over the sea level. Eh, y diferentes condiciones de suelo y de clima. In different soil conditions and climates. Por eso lo podemos ver sembrado desde Estados Unidos hasta Argentina. This is why we can see it grown from the United States to Argentina. Y desde Rusia hasta África. From Russia to Africa. Eh, y en México es muy importante el trabajo que hacen los campesinos para preservar la riqueza genética del maíz. In Mexico you can see why the work is so important to protect the richness and diversity of, of of corn. Toda esta diversidad, esta es una pequeña muestra de colores y formas de maíz, está preservada en los campesinos mexicanos. And so all of this diversity of colors and, and sizes of corn is, is protected in the cultivators in Mexico and the farmers. En México y en Mesoamérica y en Latinoamérica, los pequeños campesinos. In Mexico, South America, Latin America, Central America, it's all of this is protected in the farmers. De, de los pequeños campesinos. Of the, of the small, small scale farmers. Aquí ustedes pueden ver esta gran diversidad de maíz. Here you can see this grand diversity of corn. Y lo que nosotros hemos eh, pensado en México es que por esta gran diversidad, estas características del maíz, es que el maíz es un grano en disputa. And this is the reason that we see that the diversity of the corn is very important and and cannot be disputed. Eh, en términos del mundo, el, el maíz es el cereal que, que tiene mayor volumen de producción. On the level of the world, and the, and the world level, this is, the corn has a grand level of production. Por encima del trigo y del arroz. Um, right up there with corn, with, with, and, and with, rice. with rice and with wheat and rice. Y eh, esto se debe a la gran diversidad de usos. And this is due to the grand diverse, the use of grand diverse usage. En México hablamos que comemos el maíz en, se, en cerca de 600 diferentes formas. We use corn in over, in over 600 different forms. Tortillas, totopos, tlayudas, tlacoyos, and, and, and everything. Pero... <laughs> 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 eh, 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 pero en el modelo de agricultura y de alimentación industrial, en el agricultural world, en el food world, eh, el maíz tiene una gran importancia. 
Corn has a huge importance. Podemos encontrar el maíz en casi todos los productos industrializados eh, que están en el supermercado. We can find it as a main ingredient in most all um, food products in the markets. Como destroza, como almidón, como fructosa. And flowers and fructose. En todos estos productos que vemos aquí. And all these products that we y, see Y sobre here. todo como agrocombustibles. And, and also like agrocombustibles. Uh, esta es la razón por la que el maíz se ha convertido en el actor principal de dos modelos diferentes de producción en el mundo. El, pro, el modelo campesino y el modelo industrial. This is why corn has developed into two different worlds on the level of the, campus, of the farmers and on the, level, on the industrial level. Algunos autores han hablado que el maíz es el culpable de la epidemia de obesidad. Some authors have said that corn is the result of obesity. Pero lo que afirmamos es que es la forma en que se usa el maíz. But it's the form that we use the, use the corn that's causing this. Entonces, en México tenemos muchas experiencias en la defensa de este maíz nativo. And therefore, in Mexico, we have many forms to defend the use of, of corn. La primera de todas es la forma en que los campesinos están resguardando desde hace siglos sus semillas. The first is how small-scale small farmers are, are protecting the seeds of the corn over, since thousands of years. Eh, en los últimos años han crecido las ferias de intercambio libre de semillas. In the last couple of years, um, free trade markets, free markets, seed markets, tradings have developed over the past y, years. Y sí, algunas veces hay un mercado de semillas, pero es un mercado controlado por los mismos campesinos. Sometimes there's a market uh, for seeds, but these are markets where the farmers are controlling them. And the protection of them. No por las grandes compañías. Not for the big companies. Y bueno, también hemos res, se han rescatado muchos rituales y ceremonias alrededor del maíz. And as a cause, we've rescued many rituals and ceremonies around the practice and use of, of corn. Nosotros, eh, como un gran colectivo que nos llamamos Sin Maíz No Hay País. And we're a grand collective, and it's called Without Corn There Is No Country. Hemos y celebra, celebramos el Día del Maíz el día 29 de septiembre. On the 29th of September we celebrate the Day of Corn. Y lo que tratamos es de conmemorar la forma de producción campesina. And we're using this uh, to form a collective of knowledge um, about the cultivation of corn. Y las fiestas campesinas. And the, and, and the and the ceremonies and celebrations of the farmers. Y sobre todo la forma de ser campesino que regala la comida y nos ha alimentado durante siglos. And uh, um, celebrating the fact of being a farmer that provides food that, heal, that, that aliments us uh, for thousands of years. Eh, como ustedes saben, en México todas las fiestas tienen en el centro la comida. How you know, in all of the celebrations, there's always food at the center that feeds all of us. Y nos hemos organizado, muchas organizaciones nos hemos for, juntado para formar estas redes como la campaña Sin Maíz No Hay País. So many organizations have formed to create different networks that honor this with, with no, no maíz, no, there is no country. Y en es, e, e, otra cosa que hemos hecho es tomar la justicia en nuestras manos. And another thing that we've done is taking the justice into our own hands. Y en ese sentido es que en 2013 interpusimos una acción colectiva. And as a result of in 2013 we did a class action lawsuit. Eh, estamos eh, organizados expertos eh, científicos. We're organized as experts and scientists. Eh, artistas. Artists. Organizaciones campesinas e indígenas. Farmers, organizations, indigenous. Eh, um, uh, ambientalistas. Environmentalists. Y beekeepers. And beekeepers. <laughs> <laughs> y eh, nuestra demanda es contra Monsanto, eh, AgroDow Science, estas empresas y el gobierno mexicano. And our, our lawsuit is against Monsanto and our own government. Yes. 
And all of these? And all of these. And all of these. <laughs> Eh, eh, la razón de nuestra demanda es que eh, en las primeras siembras de maíz transgénico que se autorizaron, encontramos evidencias de que se estaba contaminando el maíz nativo. The reason that we brought this lawsuit to, to play is because we noticed that after the first plantings of these, of the modified seeds, that it's infected, impacted the native seeds too. Eh, y bueno, eh, eh, lo que nosotros eh, decimos es que se están violando los derechos a, nuestra, a nuestro ambiente sano, a nuestra alimentación, a nuestra salud y todos estos derechos. They're violating the rights to our health, to the land, and to all the rights of the seeds. Y... Eh, lo, lo, lo interesante de esta acción colectiva es que nosotros solicitamos una medida precautoria al juez. Um, the interesting part about this collective action is we've taken um, a demand to the judge. Eh, porque to the eh, argumentando que, el, que era muy fácil la contaminación del maíz y le pedimos. Um, demanding that it's very easy to... to Affect, damage the native maíz. Y, y pedimos que suspendiera cualquier siembra de maíz transgénico. And we ask that they suspend any cultivation of um, modified corn transgenic. Y la gran noticia fue que el juez nos concedió esta medida cautelar. And the judge accepted our, our demand. Y hace cinco años el maíz transgénico no puede sembrarse en México. And uh, five years ago, you're no longer to plant, no longer allowed to plant GMO seeds in Mexico. Corn. Por, por supuesto, esto no es definitivo. This is not certain. It's not definite. El juicio aún no empieza. The the court. El, el juicio principal. The initial court has still has not started. Hemos recibido cerca de 100 impugnaciones. We've received over a hundred objections. Objections. Uh -huh. I don't know that. Está ahí en inglés. Objections. Uh -huh. <laughs> We've received over a hundred objections. Estamos en 17 tribunales. We're in 17 tri tribunals. Tribunal courts. Uh -huh. Y ha sido un proceso muy largo y muy difícil. It's been a very long and difficult process. Pero hasta ahora hemos ganado la mayor parte de las demandas de las grandes empresas. But until now, we've won the majority of these battles against the bigger, bigger companies. La realidad es que la presión social ha sido muy importante. The social pressure has been exceptionally important. Como dijo la compañera. Just like our um, company said. Sin la presión social, sin el movimiento social, esto no hubiera sido posible. Without this social pressure and social demand, this never would have been possible. Eh, hemos tenido el apoyo de muy importantes personalidades como Bandana Shiva, como los más importantes chefs de México, como los artistas de México. We've had support from incredible artists and, and well-known people like Bandana Shiva. Um, really important chefs from Mexico and artists all around. Y hemos hecho varios, muchos eventos. We've made many types of events. Y bueno, finalmente estamos muy orgullosos, como lo dijo en algún momento el Wall Street Journal, que no hay país en el mundo que se haya opuesto tanto a la siembra de maíz transgénico como México. Ahí está en inglés. Yeah. There is no other country in the world opposing so much to the liberation of transgenic corn than Mexico. Y lo que nosotros pensamos es que hay que hacer milpa. 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 Eh, milpa. Eh, la milpa, la milpa es la conjunción entre lo que, las tres hermanas, el maíz, uh -huh. la calabaza y el frijol. The, la milpa is planting the three sisters, squash, beans, and corn. Y cada una le ayuda a la otra para crecer. And each one helps the other grow. El frijol fija el nitrógeno. The beans fix nitrogen. Para que el maíz crezca. So that the corn can grow. Y si en la mesa tenemos 
a la milpa tendremos una alimentación sana y suficiente. And so when we do, when we plant the three sisters together, we have a nutritious food on our tables. Y en la sociedad pensamos que podemos tener una sociedad en donde la diferencia no sea un impedimento, sino que nos ayude a unos y a otros a seguir trabajando y hacer un tejido social fuerte que soporte este mundo. So that our, in base of this and in these interactions, our society can um, work together not to impede each other, but to work together and grow together into a healthier society and healthier actions. Thank you.